Greetings! Welcome to the Vaults for Mastered. Hey, have you ever uh, had an idea for an ancestry that you wanted to play in Pathfinder 2nd Edition and you have an example of it uh, from D&D &D, and there's lots of stuff about it out there and you know, you've homebrewed your own version or used one from the book and there you are going, yeah, I, I want to run this in Pathfinder and you look in Pathfinder's book and there's nothing? Well, then this episode's for you because I'm going to have that exact scenario here and I'm going to tell you what I'm doing about it. And maybe from that, you could figure out what you could do about it. Today's episode, The Leviathan's Call, is all about hatching the worm seed ancestry. Hey, what's the worm seed? This is my remastered version of the Dragonborn from 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. And I am turning it into a Pathfinder 2nd edition ancestry. So if you're interested, come on in and check out what's up. Let's take a quick dive into the into the the concept here. So here's where we're at. Fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons has maybe one of the most popular races out there, aside from it being a little bit weak. Uh, but there's this creature known as the Dragonborn, right? You are a humanoid, walking, talking son or daughter of a dragon. Who doesn't want to play one of those? And in fifth edition, there's three different types of dragonborn you play there's the metallics the good guys there is the chromatics the bad guys and then you've got what i'm working on the gem dragonborn the gray area guys uh if you know anything about the lore of DD, those three groups of dragons represent good evil and neutrality for me i chose the gem dragons and the gem dragonborn for my subterranean world known as the vaults because they are earthy uh by nature right they are gem stone gem scaled dragon born and my whole game world is all about the plane of earth the the dark lands the underdark the subterranean world my under earth as i am calling it and so when i was designing uh this campaign about three years ago when i started it i needed lots of different races that would fit into that concept of underdark subterranean game world dark lands and i wanted a dragonborn and it didn't make sense to just throw the chromatics or i mean I guess you could maybe argue about the metallics but i wanted something earthy stony so my research took me to the gem dragonborn and the gem dragons from which they derive and so i came up with a whole system for them homebrewed based upon the dragonborn that were in the game uh, from the start the actual gem dragonborn have actually gotten their own unique sub race at this point which i'll talk about in a minute but that's kind of where the game was when i started my homebrewed world uh and so i didn't have that much problem with the basic idea of, of creating a gem dragonborn with the exception that there were no such thing as gem dragonborn at the time there were the gem dragons uh but i digress that's 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 a little bit of a later tale but what I'm looking at right now is I have a lot of information, a lot of lore, a lot of uh, homebrewed stuff for my Dragonborn, for my old game. And here I am converting it to Pathfinder and you got nothing, right? There's nothing in the game book. So I have an issue, right? I'm going to be trying to create this brand new ancestry with a bunch of heritages. I'm calling it the Worm Seed because like Pathfinder, like Paizo... I'm ditching as much of the D&D lingo as I can because who knows, they might decide to sue all of us at some point. But anyway, I decided to create a facet heritage worm seed. So in other words, a gemstone based scaled subterranean formerly known as Dragonborn. So that was, that's my objective. Now, as far as what I have for my initial comparison... If you look at Fizzband's Treasury Dragons, which came out, I don't know, like six months ago or so, one of the newer uh, releases supplements from D&D, they actually have finally given, you know, pages to the Gem Dragonborn. This is the first time that 5e had an official version. The version that I was using was not specifically this, although we have the same source material, so a lot of this is similar to what I ended up doing with my homebrewed 5th edition gem dragonware, which you'll see in a minute. 
But that's on one side of the equation to use, but on the other side of the equation, unlike my Swerf Niblin conversion that I did into the Ganesio, I don't have a before and after to see. I don't have a side-by-side -side comparison. Pathfinder 2nd Edition does not have anything resembling the Dragonborn that I'm aware of that you can rely on and use. So you're kind of left out in the dark. Also, unlike my Zulgath, uh, not even a conversion, my creation that I also uh, put out a couple of videos on, that was a Pathfinder creation. I had something I could I could dig into, some, some monster stat blocks. But here with a Pathfinder 2nd Edition Dragonborn, you don't have anything Pathfindery to look at. So you're relying completely on D&D stuff. And so this is going to be one of the more hardcore conversions that I'm going to look at. Because I have to do this mostly from scratch. Now, here is my starting material that I used for my game. My Vaults version, 5th edition rules. These are the stats or the mechanics that I'm using for my Dragonborn. This is based loosely on Master, or uh, not Master, the uh, Monster Manual 2, Roman numeral 2, from 3rd edition. That is when the Gem Dragonborns got their, you know, their spread of... Uh, you know, lore and history and everything else. So I have access, or I have that document. Let me pull it up here so you can take a look for yourself. You can see where I got my lore from. Uh, if you take a look, here it is. The Monster Manual 2 from way back in the day. Dragon Gem appearing on page 77 of the Monster Manual 2. And... Not that this is the first time Gem Dragonborns ever appeared in D&D. They had uh, appeared before that. But this is the first time they really just fleshed out and given lots of pages of lore and information. And specifically, what I was able to do from this book was to go ahead and get information about the cool stuff. Like their breath weapons. The fact that the Gem Dragonborns are psionic-based classes, so they have... Uh, you know, mind powers like telekinesis for the amethyst. Uh, and they also have different types of damage resistance. So you're going to see in my 5e conversion of this that this is where all of my cool stuff originated from, from the Monster Manual 2 3rd edition version. Okay, so that's where things got started. So what I ended up doing was going ahead and pulling that information. And taking, whoops, put, hold on one second. Just give me a little tease there, a little spoiler. I don't want to do that yet, right? Uh, but anyway, I, I took that 3E stuff uh, and used it to make my 5E version. So again, at this point in time when I started my game, there were no Gem Dragonborns officially in any of the 5E stuff. So I had to make my own. So I used the basic template of 5th edition Dragonborn and then took that Monster Manual 2 3rd edition information and, you know, stitched it together here. And this is what I came up with. So all the stuff is pretty standard fare for the Dragonborn. The big thing is that I have the Draconic Ancestries are the different gems. Uh, Amethyst, Emerald, Sapphire, Topaz. And for my fifth one, I didn't use Crystal because Crystal is like a generic term. I call mine Opal. So opalescent, uh, that kind of nice rainbowy, shimmering, cool-looking stone. I kind of thought diamond, but there was actually a diamond gem created, I think, later. But so I, I again, tangent. Don't need to go there. So those are the five that I picked, and each one of them got unique breath weapon, unique psychic psionic talent and unique damage resistance based upon the Master Manual 2 from 3rd edition. Most of the rest of the stuff is pretty just stuff from regular D&D, 5e, Dragonborn. So this is my starting point. This is all that I have to work with going into Pathfinder. That is my challenge then, right? I gotta sit here and create a brand new ancestry from scratch, essentially, just using what D&D 5e, my homebrew version, and then some of the old 3E stuff and maybe some third-party uh, concepts for uh, these particular creatures. And use that to make a complete second edition Pathfinder everything. 
then I want to make sure that whatever I create is actually going to get flavored to my Darklands, you know, game world that I'm that I'm creating and using for the vaults. I also wanted to go ahead with my plan of having six unique heritages like I have with my Ganesio and like I built with the uh, Zulgat that I just worked on. Uh, and then the ancestry itself, and now here was the trick to it because the Dragonborn are so heavily connected to their scale color that you can't make sort of a standard ancestry like you might with, you know, like Ganesio or something like that because in my opinion, or the way I did it, you couldn't have the feats define the colors or the scale types. So you couldn't just say Dragonborn Ancestry, or in my case, Wormseed Ancestry, and then, oh, I'm going to take a feat that gives me Emerald Dragon Breath. I'm going to take a feat that gives me, you know, Topaz Dragon um, Psychic Abilities. Because the problem with that is then you're going to have this whole big mix and match confusion where you got emerald parts and you got topaz parts and you got um, amethyst parts, etc, etc, etc. And that was, so I had to take the, the initial model, the initial mold for a Pathfinder Ancestry and just throw it out the window. It wasn't going to work. So that's what I'm talking about here. I had to design an Ancestry to be generic so that it could serve just as a chassis that I could put these heritages on and what that meant is that my heritages needed to be like mini ancestries they had to have, have have a lot more detail a lot more oomph to them than a typical uh heritage where you know let's say you're doing a a, a gnome and you tack the umbral gnome heritage to it you get one thing you get you know your dark vision that would not work with this so i had to make a generic ancestry this dragon board or what i'm calling now worm seed and make it so that I could plug in much more advanced heritages that gave a lot more features that actually determined and matched the scale colors or the scale the gems and then all these special little uh, abilities that went with those particular um, gem colors. So breath weapon, psychic ability, damage resistance. And then once that was all kind of figured out, I had to go back and create the feats for the whole ancestry that tied very strongly to those heritages and then of course aligned with the rules of Pathfinder and mechanics. And this was the first uh, ancestry I created and it was probably about the, well it was about the sixth or seventh that I actually made total at that point. But it was the first time that I started making heritage feats. So if you see my Ganesio video, that was one of the things I left off talking about with that little mini series was my Swerf Nimblin conversion into the Ganesio I started talking about having specific heritage feats that had the prerequisite of the heritage that you had chosen. Now, I know that sort of thing exists in Pathfinder already, but not the level and the degree to which I'm doing it, where I have six different heritages and I'm producing five different feats for each heritage that you can just zoom in and go, you know, go crazy on a particular heritage. That all got its birth, its genesis here with my with my gem dragonborn, my gem worm seed, my facet worm seed conversion. Uh these are creation. These guys are so, like I said, wrapped around that 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 color, that that metallic, that gemstone that the feats had to enhance that heritage way more than just the generic ancestry so that was a big challenge this this you'll hopefully see the amount of effort that went into this particular ancestry it was insane amounts of creative stuff had to be thrown in here all right so where are we at what are we doing well like i talked about with the Ignatio, uh mini series there where i talked about a little bit with the zolgath creation i have a template i use which matches Pathfinder's, you know, uh, ancestry entries that has some guiding questions, has some, some statements. I take this information. I take my lore from my game world. I feed that into Kathy, which is chat GPT, my AI muse. And I also relied upon sale a lot for this one too, which I think you'll agree is going to produce some wicked, awesome AI art dolly. If you haven't used him yet, damn. Okay, that's all I got to say. It is based upon the same open AI chat um, conversational AI system. 
so it's really user friendly you don't need to come up with some crazy prompts and you know like you have to do with some of the other stuff and you know use discord and whatever else this works right through um chat gpt if you have the the plus version 4.0 anyway using my tools using my notes using my ideas plugging it in with this template and click and go now if you rewind the clock a little bit this uh, ancestry was also one of the first ones I started to deploy Kathy on because prior to that I was doing this the old-fashioned way hard right I was taking all kinds of books and you know internet sources and pulling copy paste and stuff from all over the place uh, and you know home brewing you know by hand essentially everything uh, and that's you know so when I found out about this chat GPT thing. This was one of my first projects I gave Kathy at the time. I was using the, the 3.5 version. I said, hey, help me with this. And when I started seeing the results, I was sold. And I've, you know, been using it ever since. So there you go. So I plugged this in and got some cool results. Let's take a look. Rather than me talking about it, let me show you. And I already gave you the spoiler. Here is what... I ended up generating with my various tools and I was just going sick with sale today to get some more art for this for this uh, video and man I was impressed because when I was trying to do this originally back six months ago the I forget what AI art thing I was using but it was not user-friendly and it was this crapshoot every time you clicked you know generate anyway Facet Worm Seed Ancestry. Let's go. Let's read through this. Let's see what's happening here. There is a gorgeous picture of one of the Ruby Dragonborn. Hey, I didn't mention rubies were one of my heritages. Am I holding out on you guys? No, you will see that they do not technically exist in my game world. So let's go. In the shadow depths of the vaults, the Facet Worm Seed trace their lineage to a time of splendor and grandeur before mere mortals walked the earth. Descendants of the mighty crystal dragons, these beings once flourished under the rule of their leviathan lords, whose gemstone scales shone with an inner light of purity and honor. The worm seed thrived in cities of stunning architectural marvels with grand ziggurats and sprawling plazas spanning all corners of the vaults and beyond. Their ruby king Sarnix, an epitome of fairness and wisdom, governed a society that was a beacon of culture and enlightenment to all peoples of the underearth. But this glittering era was shattered when the meteor known as the Dragon's Hammer crashed onto the surface world, sending cataclysmic tremors through the vaults. The once mighty cities of the Leviathans and their Wormseed children crumbled, and chaos reigned. From this turmoil emerged the Ghoul Imperium, a relentless horde of undead creatures coveting the Wormseed's mystical power. In the darkest hour, Sarnix made the ultimate sacrifice. He dispersed the horde, but at the cost of his own form, leaving behind mere scales as a testament to his once great existence. The aftermath saw the worm seed in disarray, their civilization in ruins. They played a pivotal role in establishing Pedestal, a city built upon the remnants of their fallen glory. Yet, the seekers of the Dark Well soon rose to power, enslaving the worm seed and forcing them into labor in warpstone mines. Stripped of their heritage and freedom, they could wield but a fraction of their ancestral fury and quickly fell into servitude to the fanatical bathers of the Black Blood. Amidst this despair, a beacon of hope persisted, the Scions of Sarnix. This valiant group, formed from the few who escaped the shackles of slavery, dedicated to reviving their lost heritage and freeing their brethren, dedicated themselves to freeing. Sorry, let me edit that real quick. They clung to the legend of the Ruby King, whose heart, taken by the remnants of the Ghoul Imperium, was believed to still pulse with life deep within enemy territory. It is said that the Ruby Worm Seed, the King's elite champions, still wage an eternal battle to reclaim this sacred relic. Today's Facet Worm Seed carry not only the physical might of their Leviathan forebears, but also the burden of a fallen empire. Their breath is as fearsome as their ancestors, and their minds wield psionic powers that can bend reality. Yet their hearts are heavy with the loss of their past and an unyielding yearning for the day when they will rise again, as resplendent as the gems that once adorned their ancestral halls. Awesome. Beautiful. All right, so hey, just a little bit of background information. 
Uh, the Ruby Dragon uh, Sarnix, which is derived from Sardior, uh, from D&D lore, so renaming that, of course. Uh, so Sarnix was their king. He would be one of my primordials, one of my primal entities in the Underearth here. Uh, his, his children, the Rubies, are not in-game because the ones who survived this this battle with the Ghoul Imperium, which, by the way, is a Cobalt Press uh, shout-out because uh, they've got the Empire of the Ghouls, love Cobalt Press products, uh, and I've converted a lot of that to my game as well. But anyway, the Rubies have disappeared into the depths, into the deeps, to essentially attack the Imperium to recover the heart of Sardior, the, the giant ruby gemstone that was you know at the center of his chest when he such he blew himself up in order to take out the horde of the ghouls these dara cool that were attacking uh the city at the time that was really the last time that the dragonborn were in power in charge so thousands of years of that history have fallen to the wayside so the survivors uh ultimately have been enslaved by my one of my cults here the Seekers of the Dark Well, that is my remastered, renamed version of uh, the Black Earth Cult that I mentioned a little while ago. Uh, so I have remastered that. Uh, and that cult is the, we're the big bad evil guys of my game. Uh, they have since also fallen from their perch. Uh, and that is due to the cataclysmic events that my players unleashed and triggered at the end of my D&D campaign in September. Anyway, starting new, starting now, Pathfinder, things are reset. The Dragonborn, a lot of them have been freed now. A lot of them are able to have the shackles have been taken off. They are ready to go. Perspectives. You might possess an unmatched resilience. Worm seed tenacity and determination are legendary. Your people have been knocked down many times before and, and have always risen. They have endured decades of enslavement and oppression, but have not been broken. You are tough and hardy, able to withstand great physical and emotional pain. You refuse to give up regardless the odds. You might yearn for a resurgence of your people. Like many of your kin, you are waiting for the glorious return of the rubied sovereign. Uh, you, you dream of restoring the vaults to their former glory when the Leviathans ruled and great draconic cities filled the largest caverns. You hold a deep reverence for your lost history and culture. You could be passionate about unearthing and preserving the remnants of your once great civilization, seeking out ancient artifacts or delving into forgotten lore. This longing could manifest in a mix of hope and impatience, perhaps even leading to actions aimed at hastening this revival. You might practice secret traditions. With much of your culture having been suppressed or lost, you might engage in secret practices or rituals passed down through generations. These could range from specific martial techniques to clandestine ceremonies meant to keep the spirit of the Leviathans alive. By the way, I really like how Pathfinder has these perspectives, these you mites or the others probably, because I think it really helps players come up with backstories, come up with uh, ideas how their characters you know, evolve or fit into the game. It's also really nice from a GM perspective because it gives you lore that you're able to tap into that, you know, you can tell a player who is, let's say, playing one of these worm seed seeds, you can tell them, oh, yeah, you remember from your history that. Or, you know, the player might not necessarily know a certain of how they might react normally. Let's say they see somebody smashing some draconic stuff or, you know, pilfering some draconic history. That might be a little, you know, whispered, you know, uh, conversation with a player. Hey, by the way, you might be a little bit upset about what's going on here because maybe one of your allies is stealing some draconic stuff or you see some NPC is, you know, selling something on the black market that used to be, you know, part of the draconic uh, kingdoms. You could see how that might spur some cool uh, dialogue or role playing, that kind of thing. All right, let's continue. Others probably... View you with a mix of pity and fear. Others see the facet worm seed as tragic figures, once mighty but now fallen and pitiable. But still, you have a deep connection to the mighty leviathans of yore, and everyone has a story about a worm seed who has manifested this passionate and intense heritage in some kind of wild and untamed outburst. Those who are wise respect your simmering fierceness. 
Despite your current circumstances of being a marginalized people, you remain proud and fierce with a deep reservoir of resentment toward the Seekers of the Dark Well who enslaved you, which would mostly be Dorgar and some of the Oread, uh, as well as some of the Orth from, again, my D&D version of this game world. Pre-cataclysmic events. Uh, others probably underestimate your ambition and intelligence. Given your people's current state, most others do not realize the extent of your longing for restoration or the lengths you might go to achieve it. Many are surprised by your natural aptitude for problem solving and strategic thinking as well. They do not realize that your ancestors were the great engineers and mathematicians of old who built the foundation for the culture surviving today. I kind of am using sort of the Mayan cultures or like the Aztec, you know, Mesoamerican culture says inspiration for my version of these gem dragon boards. So they build these, you know, ziggurat pyramids and they were very engineering savvy and very astronomically, you know, knowledgeable mathematics, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then the last bullet point here is others probably are intrigued by your mysterious past. The lore and legends surrounding your ancestors, especially the Ruby Sovereign and the Obsidian Queen, uh, that's another D&D reference to Saradess, who was Sardior's queen. My game world, we have Sarnix and we have Laradress. Laradress is actually the avatar of one of my players who decided to allow their body to be possessed by the Dark Lady, the Obsidian Queen. Uh, and become an unleashed primordial. That was one of the cataclysmic events at the end of my D&D campaign. Anyway, uh, this could lead to a mixture of fascination and wariness in their interactions with you. So again, this is some cool stuff that you can use for backstories, for NPC reactions to the players. You name it, there's lots of stuff here. There could be some plot hooks here. A couple things were going in my head as I was thinking of, you know, reading through these ideas, you know things about maybe there's somebody one of the seekers of the dark well has stolen some draconic stuff and you need to go fetch it that would be cool plus it can really give you a real strong incentive to go take that person down all right moving on physical description or just description facet worm seed are known for their towering stature and robust physique commonly standing over six feet tall and weighing around 250 pounds the rapid growth is a hallmark of their ancestry. They become mobile mere hours after hatching, reach physical the physical maturity of an adolescent by age 3, and attain full adulthood by 15. Despite their formidable presence, their lifespan is relatively short, averaging around 80 years. In appearance, facet worm seed are striking with powerful builds and muscular frames. They are mostly wingless and possess a long, sleek form that allows them to navigate the narrow tunnels of their subterranean homes with ease. Their scales, reminiscent of various gemstones, glitter and shimmer in even the faintest light, displaying a spectrum of radiant colors. These scales can range from translucent to deeply saturated hues, with clarity and color intensity often becoming more pronounced with age. Their, sharp, their eyes are sharp, piercing, and typically mirror the dominant color of their scales, lending them a gaze of intense focus and commanding respect. Gender differences and facet worm seed are subtle and may not be immediately noticeable to non worm seed. Males tend to have a slightly bulkier and more muscular builds, while females usually possess a more streamlined and agile form. Both genders feature large fangs, sharp talons, and spines, though the size and prominence of these features can vary individually. The intricate patterns and markings on their bodies are a distinctive aspect of their heritage. These patterns often become more complex and pronounced as they age, with elders displaying the most elaborate and detailed markings. The patterns can also serve as indicators of lineage, with certain designs and motifs being characteristic of specific family. Overall, facet worm seed are majestic and awe-inspiring, embodying the power and grandeur of the leviathan dragons from which they descend. Their appearance is not only a display of physical might, but also a reflection of their rich cultural and ancestral heritage. I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted by these pictures again, because, man, it, I was spent a whole bunch of time today, and I was just wowed by what Dolly was coming out with. Sal, he was the man today. All right, society. At their pinnacle, the Facet Worm Seed Society was a beacon of architectural and cultural magnificence. Their grand cities, now lost to history, were marvels of engineering and artistry with towering ziggurats and vast uh, plazas that spanned the subterranean realms. Governed by a benevolent monarchy, the Worm Seed flourished under a well-structured caste system. 
Each individual's role was defined by heritage and skill, fostering a society where every worm seed could contribute to the greater good. Their rulers, epitomized by the Ruby King Sarnix, ensured fairness and wisdom guided, guided their decisions, making their civilization a paragon for all inhabitants of the vaults. The current state of facet worm seed society starkly contrasts its illustrious past. Enslaved and broken by the seekers of Darkwell, they toil in the depths of Pedestal, a city that stands as a grim reminder of their fall from grace. The once intricate trade networks and cultural exchanges have been replaced by forced labor and warp stone mines and oppressive servitude. Despite the suppression of their heritage, the worm seed cling to their dragon ancestry, practicing their faith and traditions in secret, away from the prying eyes of their captors. Now, some of this is changed a bit. Not that the Seekers of the Dark Well are going to suddenly free them all, but the City of Pedestal was heavily damaged by the events with this cataclysmic uh, finale to my 5e game. Uh, and so part of the city actually collapsed into the deeper um, vaults where the game world was taken, actual taken for lace. And so that has caused a huge upheaval with the uh, the Durgar, who are known as the Droog, who were the Black Hammer. That is the, the military faction of the Seekers of the Dark Well. That cult has been shaken to its core and is and has lost a lot of their 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 potency, a lot of their their pull, uh, and a lot more rebellion now is taking place in the city. Plus, there's just chaos is starting to reign up there as people are starting to flood and flee to the deeper vaults. As you know, all hell is breaking loose up there at this point. I don't want to put any more spoilers out that out there than that. So anyway, a lot more Dragonborn are now free, uh, although there are still you know work camps. There are still you know, the slave pits, there are still the warp stone mines are going on, but a lot of them are able to get get free, and now more would be going to try to free their brothers and sisters that are still held captive. All right, so continuing on, the worm seed continue to uphold their cultural practices and traditions, albeit in a more subdued manner. They gather in hushed assemblies to share stories of their past, sing songs of their ancestors, and teach the younger generations about their lost heritage. Artistic expression, once a cornerstone of their society, now manifests in hidden forms, clandestine sculptures, underground music, and dances performed in the shadows of their oppressive environment. Games of strategy and skill, like dragon chess, provide not only a mental respite from their daily struggles, but also a means to keep their tactical and intellectual prowess sharp. Again, some of this is changed. There's less oppression overall, although there still exists. So the Dragonborn are more free to start to express their true nature now that they don't have as much to worry about from, you know, the Black Hammer, from the Seekers of, Dark, of the Dark Well. The breakdown of traditional family structures under slavery has led to the formation of new familial bonds. These bonds are based on shared experiences and mutual support in the face of adversity. The worm seed revere their elders who are repositories of ancient knowledge and wisdom. These elders often lead covert gatherings and serve as the custodians of their dwindling heritage. Despite the harshness of their current reality, the facet worm seed culture is marked by an unyielding strength and resilience. They hold on to the hope of liberation and the dream of one day resurrecting their civilization to its former glory. The scions of Sarnix embody the spirit, tirelessly working to keep the flame of their ancestry alive and kindling the hope of a renaissance among the people. The facet worm seed those shackled have not forsaken their aspirations. They yearn for the day when they can rebuild their cities and restore the grandeur of their ancestors. Many believe that the return of the Ruby Sovereign will herald a new era of freedom and prosperity. And this belief fuels their enduring spirit in the face of overwhelming odds. In summary, the Facet Worm Seed Society is a tapestry woven from the threads of a rich, lost heritage and the grim reality of their present. Their enduring strength, cultural resilience, and unbroken spirit paints a picture of a people who refuse to be defined by their current circumstances and continue to hope and strive for a brighter future. So I really like this section. It gives, again, more fuel for backstories, more plot hooks are possible here. You can see your players really just able to grab onto some of these concepts and weave it into their, to their characters. They're building it up. And then you as, a, as the GM can use this to kind of poke at them, to hook them, to get them to to do things, you know, that are just natural for their their species to want to react to. 
So I'm looking forward to, because I actually have two of my players are planning on playing these worm seeds. So this is going to be fun using this information to, to kind of get them really involved in the game a lot more. See, this is uh, kind of the other thing I was talking about. Uh, I figured it was like, I think Mike Anishio video that one of the disappointing things, at least with 5e, having been a, a home brewer and kind of a student of the game, you know, as I was home brewing, so, and I was going back and look at some of the older editions, you know, like I was just showing you that, uh, that monster manual from third edition. There's so much friggin' lore in the older editions, third, 3e, 4e, whatever, 2e. Fifth edition just like scrapped, I don't know, like three quarters of the lore that used to be in the game. It's disgusting to be honest with you. I mean, it's so sad. Um, and that's why, you know, when you sit there and look at the, the player's handbook, they got these little blurbs, you know, for each of the, the, the races. There's really not much there that you can, you know, bite into and like run with your character. You have to rely so much on more stereotypical uh you know thoughts like or uh experiences you know like elves oh yeah i saw lord of the rings so i want to be like you know legolas or something like that and and there's so little game lore in the core books now at least on D, &D side of things that it's really disappointing and you don't know this when you're first you know playing the game right i mean you're just oh i want to be a, one of these cool dragon dudes right you don't know all the history of that and how, how like in fourth edition there's the dragonborn and the tieflings like you know had a you know, war pretty much, I think it was. I mean, that's cool lore. And then every time they seem to change their edition, they ditch their lore and restart with some brand new version of it, which doesn't make sense either. Anyway, let's continue. Beliefs. The facet worm seed, once united under the rule of their Leviathan lords, have diverse, have diverse beliefs shaped by their tumultuous history. Their primary deities include Sarnix, the Ruby King, I gotta standardize that from Ruby Sovereign to Ruby King. Sarnix, the Ruby King. Let's do this real quick. Ruby Sovereign. I don't change the Ruby King. Replace all. There we go. Three other places. All right. So anyway, sorry about this. I had to fix it while I'm thinking about it. Uh, their primary deities include Sarnix, the Ruby King, embodying strength, honor, and sacrifice, and Lara Dress, the Dark Lady, representing betrayal, ambition, and resilience. They also venerate other lesser-known Leviathan lords who symbolize various aspects of their ancient culture and virtues. I left that part cryptic like that uh, because this way, if a player wants to learn more about, let's say, a famous opal dragon or Leviathan, as they're called, then we can develop that together, right? We can come up with a new concept. There are, if you go and, you know, look at some of the old, uh, what I think is like, third fourth edition stuff there are names of some of these old powerful ancient um gem dragonborns in D, &D terms so there is some history out there some lore already and that, that you can use to help develop your own but nothing stop me from coming up with brand new stuff right especially if you're using like chat gpt to assist you anyway uh in their current state of oppression many worm seed have turned to wretch who's one of my new primordials a a deity symbolizing the struggle against suffering and the fight for liberation. This is like a tortured um, primordial. In an ironic, some would say masochistic twist, some find solace in the worship of Erzul, who is my version of Ogremach. So rewind real quick. Black Earth Cult was my big, bad, evil guy organization in my 5e game. They were on, their main goal was to free Ogremach, who is the Stone Tyrant, a primordial Earth, one of the uh, elemental, uh, princes of elemental evil. Reskinning, remastering, I'm using Erzul, who's the fossilized king of Pathfinder entities, like a giant T-Rex, you know, fossil dinosaur. Uh, that is stepping into the role of my evil primordial earth entity that is trapped somewhere here in the bowels of the vaults anyway some of these worm seed who remember were tormented and enslaved by the the droog who are the dorgar who are the main group of uh ancestry people that are you know worshiping Ogremach slash Erzul were members of the Black Earth Cult, which is now called the uh, Seekers of Dark of the Dark Well. So, like it's these these worm seed are now worshiping the entity that was 
essentially tormenting them. So that's kind of the sick, twisted thing that's going on. Uh, and so uh, perhaps these worm seed were brainwashed, but the fossilized king represents, to them anyway, the unyielding aspects of the earth, which resonates among the draconic people. So they perhaps feel that, yeah, even though this guy was beating me, or, well, not he was beating me, but, you know, his followers, um, he himself is trapped and suffering and has had his flesh removed and it's just bones and but still still kicking right so they kind of the sick twisted vision of that uh or maybe they were collaborators you could throw that in there right and still others revere erzul's sister and again i'm using another pathfinder uh deity here uh Cyrazul, i think is how you say it that is the replacement for sunis who I mentioned soonest in my Ganesio video. So if you haven't seen that, when I talked about my beliefs for my Ganesio, my Swerf Niblin recast, I talked about how they follow uh, the Cyrusal, who is soonest. She's the true stone. She's like the magnetic north. So picture a, a elemental, primordial magnetic who guides her children home, you know, points the way. So there were, uh, this is another entity that these worm seed will worship, uh, especially like the patron of the runaways, the people who were escaping from the camps, uh, the slavery, the pits, the uh, gladiatorial pits, the warp stone mines, you know, this, this tortured uh, life that the worm seed were suffering for decades and decades. Uh, you know, Cyrusel would have been their patron, uh, true stone guiding them to safety. Additionally, many worm seed are drawn to Kavarka. I have a set of videos about that primordial Kavarka. So if you haven't seen those, go check those out. The Ward of the Luminar Nexus. He is represent. He is this giant gemstone uh, primordial. He would be. Uh, I think he's just, is he related to those other two? I don't actually know. He's not related to Cyrusel and Erzul. They're related. They're. They are one. Were they brother and sister? I believe. Yeah, I think they were brother and sister. Uh, or at least some, there's some weird relationships. I, I, I still, I get a bunch of weird stuff that's still kind of percolate through my brain. So anyway, there's a lot of, I don't want to say inbreeding, but there's a lot of brothers and sisters and cousins stuff. All these primordials are the children of God. So they are all related in some way, shape or form down here. So anyway, the worm seed, Kavarka, they like him because he's gems, shininess, brilliance, enlightenment. And they think through his worship that they, just like he, you know, teaches reshaping gems to unlock their potential, you know, strive for perfection. That is how they will be reborn, how their culture will be reborn. Same kind of metaphor for, for them. Uh, then beyond these, these deities, Wormseed's beliefs center around honor, resilience, wisdom, unity. So very, you know, kind of knightly, chivalrous concepts. They emphasize the importance of rediscovering their lore protecting the oppressed and maintaining the integrity of their ancient traditions chief among these philosophies is the path of the unbroken crystal which teaches the importance of maintaining one's integrity and purity of purpose followers believe in living a life of honor and clarity free from the corruption of external influences edicts preserve ancient wisdom uphold the worm seed legacy by serving seeking knowledge and wisdom from the past and practicing secret traditions to keep the spirit of the Leviathans alive. I kind of like this idea about the secret traditions. I can kind of see almost a cult growing within the worm seed to protect and preserve their legacy. Who leads that cult? What primordial? Is it good? Is it evil? I could see it being nasty, right? You could see them going after people who maybe have recovered some of the um, ancient draconic lore or artifacts and going and killing these people, stealing the stuff from them, beating the location out of them, you know, they could get pretty violent. So I can kind of see some nasty um, worm seed uh, behavior in the future. This right here could be a plot hook. This could be a whole story, you know, storyline. It could start off as a minor little thing. You're hired to, to protect somebody from some thugs that are trying to steal something. It turns out it's worm seed coming to get back some artifact that your your employer 
stole from one of their ancient temples. Or maybe he got it legitimately and you need to break it to these wormsy that no, they can't have it. This was fair and square that, you know, they, they're they stealing it. Moral dilemma right there, right? Anyway, uh, other edicts. You stand against oppression, actively resist tyranny and injustice, symbolizing the unyielding spirit of the worm seed in the face of adversity. They themselves have come from oppression and slavery. So if they see it happening again to someone else, you could see them like snapping and going after the person doing it. Or, you know, kind of standing up uh, to free people. You know, what was it? I think it was Zorro, maybe. Something like that, helping the, you know, the poor, downtrodden people. I don't want to say Robin Hood, but same kind of concept. Uh, foster kinship and community. Strengthen bonds within the worm seed community. Embracing unity and cooperation is vital for survival and resurgence. Anathemas. Betrayal of kin. Uh, worm seed are going to avoid actions that harm or betray fellow worm seed. As loyalty and kinship are sacred. Yeah, I mean, above all else, worm seed are together. They're They're united. Unless you're one of the obsidian ones, they don't necessarily like them too much because the obsidian ones were the children of Laradress, who in the lore of the Wormseed betrayed Sarnix. That's something I didn't see pop out in my my lore here, so I might have to go back and revise that part and put that back in that that blip about the obsidians, Laradress, and how they're seen as traitors. Submission to tyranny. Shun accepting oppressive rule for or failing to challenge injustice as it contradicts the worm seed spirit of freedom. And then the last anathema is neglect of heritage. Refrain from disregarding ancient traditions and cultural practices as they are the foundation of worm seed identity. Yeah, I'm really kind of liking this idea because when my game was last running, most of the worm seed or the drag board at the time, they were, they were, you know in shackles they were in chains uh so anybody who was a player character that was a dragonborn you would effectively be on the run and there weren't a lot of them in game just because of that that history that situation but now the game is fast forwarded six months later as i said a bunch of them have escaped a bunch have been freed the cult that was you know oppressing them has fallen down several pegs uh, with their power and control. So there's more and more Dragonborn are now going to be possibly in the game. And so you can kind of see this whole thing really becoming a f like a forefront potential conflict. You know, as these more Dragonborn are now free, they're no longer worried about just surviving, you know, the next day. They might start looking around and going, especially because they're going into the to the lower vaults, which is where their ruins lie. Like the game world, for the most part, is taking place uh, looking and scouring through some of these ruins. And a lot of those are draconic in origin. So they might see all this delving into these into these locations as, um, you know, sacrilegious or something. So that could that's a whole nother, you know, crazy concept or whatever uh, conflict that can be unleashed or tapped into all right names the worm seed being descendants of leviathans often choose names that echo the magnificence and mystique of their forebears their names may blend the grandeur of draconic culture with the luster and depth of gemstones symbolizing their unique heritage and the elemental powers they wield Titles often inspired by their roles in the lost draconic civilization or the skills they possess are commonly adopted. These titles may reflect their gemstone affinity, martial prowess, psionic abilities, or even their role in the ongoing struggle for freedom and restoration. Got a whole bunch of male names here, a bunch of female names, and then the nicknames are actually the titles. So they're based upon a memorable deed like flame strike ice fang shadow claw so that would have been something that happened in that dragonborn's lifetime that people would call them ah flame strike it is you you remember that time you used flame strike right there oh ice fang you remember when you took that frozen block uh that frozen icicle and stabbed the so-and-so to death with it the overseer yes ah ha ha good times so that's what these names, these titles would represent. All right, then adventuring. This is the last part of the ancestry document. 
And this is gets into, you know, why would uh, a worm seed get involved in an adventuring career? What kind of background might they, you know, derive from and what sort of classes might they be, you know, drawn to? All right, adventuring. As descendants of the mighty Leviathans, the facet worm seed are inherently a proud and powerful people. Yet their existence is marred by hardship and adversity. Many facet worm seed are born into the shackles of servitude, laboring in the depths of warpstone mines, or forced to display their martial prowess as gladiators for the amusement of the seekers of the dark well. A fortunate few, born free, often find themselves fleeing from their oppressors, their mere existence posing a threat of retribution from these dark forces. In the heart of every facet worm seed lies the indomitable spirit of the Leviathans, driving them towards greatness. This drive may manifest as a thirst for vengeance against their oppressors, leading many to embrace the path of an adventurer. They seek to hone their combat skills, acquire powerful allies, and ultimately forge a path of freedom and justice. Others turn inward, delving into the arcane mysteries of their draconic heritage, aspiring to unlock potential magical abilities akin to their legendary ancestors. The lives of the facet worm seed were shaped by the stark realities of survival and resistance. Some found their mettle tested in the seeker's cruel arenas. As gladiators, they became spectacles of violence and resilience. Their every battle a fight for survival, their every victory a testament to their unyielding spirit. This brutal existence honed their combat skills and fortitude, molding them into warriors prepared for the uncertainties of adventuring life. Others toiled under the oppressive yoke of the Black Hammer. It's not the Blue. Yeah, it is still the Black Hammer. Uh, overseers in the Warpstone Mines. These laborers, enduring the relentless grind, mastered the use of both tools and weapons. Their laborers, a reflection of their un enduring spirit and physical prowess. Meanwhile, the freeborn facet worm seed, those fortunate enough to escape the chains of servitude, were often trained in the arts of war. As warriors, they stood as steadfast guardians of their hidden communities, facing raiders and monstrous threats that lurked in the dark recesses of the vaults. Descendants of the mighty Leviathans, facet worm seed have historically been drawn to professions that resonate with their inherent strengths and ancestral powers. Many find their calling as fighters, their natural strength and resilience, making them formidable combatants. The harsh realities of their lives, marked by struggle and rebellion, often leads others down the path of the barbarian, where their primal fury and endurance can be unleashed in full force. Others, attuned to the mystical legacy of their draconic forebears, gravitate toward the arcane arts. As sorcerers, they tap into their innate magical abilities, channeling the elemental energies that flow through their veins. Some delve deeper into the mysteries of magic, becoming wizards who seek to unlock the secrets of their draconic heritage through study and discipline. In addition, their keen senses and natural affinity for stealth make some worm seed exceptional rogues. And that is the end of the ancestry document. And so, to conclude, based upon this, I was then able to generate the mechanics page, but I'm not going to show any more of it until next session. All right. Hey, I appreciate you guys taking some time tonight and checking out this video. I look forward to you uh, going over these mechanics as well as the heritages because, my friends, the heritages, I'm going to tell you, are crazy, 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 crazy good. Um, smoking hot, right? So. If you want to see what happened, you want to see who this beautiful fellow is, you got to tune in. Like the vids, subscribe to the channel, comments, notification, you know the drill. Uh, that'll let you know when the next video is coming out, which should be in the next day or so. Uh, and then I'm going to dive into those heritages, go over those mechanics I just uh, teased you with, and then get into some feats similar to what I did with the Ganesio little series and what I was also working out with the Zolgath. All right, I hope you all had fun, and I look forward to seeing you again in the next episode. Have a good night, and take care.